Welcome to <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, I'll move right along. I won't give any preamble, and because we need to get through quite a bit this morning. But but thank you for being here. So um, basically, just to get the the grounding, the ethos behind HR twenty nine ninety, which is comes from Stephen and his work in the Lost Science of Money book. It's just um, practical strategy, minimum change, non-disruptive, seamless changeover. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Sometimes I just tend to go into a mumble. Okay. So again, the, the themes that, that come up through HR 2090 that I've that, that resonate with me anyway, and I hope that they'll resonate with you, is constitutional, sustainable, and balance. Okay, so the overall, what, what HR 2990 is, is a bill to be, the, um, to be an act of Congress, which is the overall authorizing and enabling legislation, and then as part of that, in the bill, there's a provision for further legislation to come in within a certain period to um, basically enunciate all of the details, which would, you know, that bill would be probably thousands of pages long. But what this bill is, is the first is the act of Congress to enable and authorise for this other stuff to start being done. Okay, so that's why... Otherwise, this bill, if, if you tried to um, get this bill introduced with everything in it, it would just be far too much. It's, it's already incredibly difficult for people to understand this stuff. And if you had all of this other detail in it, it would, it would re be really impossible. So that's why it's, it's a practical way of doing it this way. Okay, so... What HR 2990 does, it formally establishes the minimum necessary structural reforms of the monetary system. And as again, in a simple and non-disruptive way. And one of the things I want to um, impart to you is that from, from what I've been able to gather, the research that I've done, every part of what's in HR 2990 is already in use in some way, not ne not necessarily in the way that it would be in HR 2090, but the, there is a precedent and and practice for everything that's in here. So it's not like it's making up something completely new. It's it's something that people that know about this stuff that will be developing this detailed legislation in the future, they will they will have a template to be able to work off because it's stuff that's already being done now. So it's not like having to invent anything new. And um, and again, the principles and the procedures and the technology, including the uh, computer platforms, all of that is already in use as well. And it's already in place and ready to go. Actually, it's all um, it's already there. So there's not a huge amount of um, practical work that needs to be done for this to be implemented. It's just political work. <laughs> okay, so again, the, in the context of this, what this is all about really is applying the science of money. And the science of money, I'll talk about a little bit, but it's something that you really have to, you have to, um, you have to learn, and you have to learn by reading Stephen's book, The Lost Science of Money. You have to learn it by reading Joseph Huber's work. And, and um, once, you, once you have done that, I think you will be able to understand what we mean by the science of money. And it's, it's a science because it's, it's based on looking at things that happen. And it's based on empirical 
evidence and results. So it's an inductive approach, not a deductive sort of reasoning. Okay, so the key to understanding the science of money is having a clear definition of money. And so this definition is the culmination of Stephen's book, The Lost Science of Money, which uh, goes through about 5,000, but, but particularly 3,000 years of what we can call proper money. And, and Stephen has researched the, the case histories and, the, the, and has culminated the, the, th uh, the definitions of all of the great thinkers in the past, and this is what it comes up with. Okay, so in the bill it talks about US money and what that is is the same as what Joseph Huber's plain sovereign money is or liquid sovereign money. And here this is what's we what this is what Joseph Huber means by sovereign money. <coughs> and you can read all about this on his new website that he's launched for the English language called sovereignmoney.eu and I encourage you to read everything on that website to understand all about sovereign money. Also US money is the same as what is described for money in Positive Money's work and it is basically an asset to the holder and a liability to nobody. Okay, so at present um, the flow of funds accounts which um, are collected by the Federal Reserve System, <coughs> they, they, it's, it's all of the financial assets and liabilities, but it does not include real assets. So <coughs> if you wanted to have a full proper balance sheet of the economy and, and by extension society, you would want to, I th well I think, my thinking is you'd want to include real assets, but then you see that there would not be a, a balance there, that the balance sheet would not be balanced. So what we, what we, uh, the way we think of it is adding a, so something to balance that. And so at the moment our money supply is built as, an, as part of this and there's a corresponding bank loans here. So what, what HR 2990 does is it takes the money supply out of here and puts it down here and to keep this in balance it replaces what was treated as a liability as the money supply here with a, a liability to pay the money from here through to the government to then recycle through again so that it, everything still balances but it's like, a, it's like a clearing or flushing mechanism. Okay, so what we have here then is we have the, the real, real assets and that can, that can include, I, th I think people are real assets as well and I think our, our knowledge is real assets but we can start off with, with physical things and we can develop our, our national and social balance sheet. But um, so then we have money here which is a claim on this real wealth but it's, it's not a, it's not a um, it doesn't mean that, that uh, people that hold wealth have an obligation because they have to be willing to part with their wealth for the money so it's not in my way of thinking it is not a debt and because a claim on something is an asset it's like having having a share of stock in a company. Okay. So I'll just I'll just go through these. I won't because I have to we have to get through this pretty quickly, but I'll just let you have a look at these, yeah. 
Okay, so what financial assets are, well, I'd call money a primary financial asset, and then other financial assets are built up on top of that, and they are claims on money. So they are not directly claims on wealth, they are claims on money, and then money is the claim on wealth. And here we see that we bring in this um, equation of money with equity. And then before the, the balance sheet, the uh, balance sheets I showed you before were the, were, were the static situation, the stock. And now what we're really interested in, because the economy is a dynamic thing, it's a thing that moves, that things change with time. So we really are interested in the flows. And so it's, it's this that we really um, want to be looking at with regard to being able to control for inflation and deflation, controlling the supply is also really about controlling the flow. So then we have all of the, all of the different um, assets and, but the, it doesn't, the, the, there's, a, there's a huge amount of um, financial assets in the economy, um, but that's because, they're, that, but they're, they're just transfers of money. They're just like the recordings of transfers of money. So you don't, I'll show you a, another diagram here that's coming up. And so you, you also want to split between um, existing wealth and the creation or production of new wealth. Like um, Dr. Richard Werner was talking about um, having to be able to split between what's going into existing assets like real estate or what's going into creating new wealth like going into factories that are producing cars and things like that. So these, this is why there's um, lots of financial liabilities in the, um, the flow of funds accounts that the Federal Reserve keeps is because there's there's a, um, a series of um, exchanges of money for financial assets. And so that's why the total credit market debt is like, you know, 55, 60 trillion, but the money supply is like 11, 12 trillion or whatever. And so it's because there's, there can be like five or six different stages of money changing hands between, between someone parting with the money and someone using the money. So that's so. Don't so you don't have don't don't be too concerned about all of this uh, total credit market debt. That's that's the why it's like that. Okay, and so the, the money flows this way, and then eventually this person earns some money, and then it can flow back the other way back to the saver ultimately. We hope. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, what the Constitution says, and um, so you see it has. Uh, in the same clause as money, it has weights and measures. So it's like a, a measurement science. Okay, so this is the, the three basic steps of the, or the three key elements of, they're not steps, they have, have to be done together. Um, the key elements, which we, I talked about in a, my talk um, on Thursday. And again, three key words that you have to understand that, that that really helped me to understand HR 2990, and I think that they're the key words for, for really understanding what it's about. And equity here, that's what that means. And it, you see it represents something, something real, but it is not itself something real. And um, there's a there's a quite nice um, complementary definitions of, of of the word equity for different types of meanings that we all may also be familiar with. And we, I will we will make this um, available so that you can you know have a look at it and be able to read it in more detail. But 
I hope to just be able to move along and then we can, um, if there's particular questions, we can come back to it in the question time. So bailment, this is the, this is the word that I hadn't heard of before. <laughs> I had to look it up in the dictionary. It was, uh, came back from the, the bill drafters that, um, that Jim Wirt worked on this. So he, you know, he's an expert in all of this stuff. And this is, um, when, I, when, I found, when I went to the dictionary and found out what it means, it, it's, it's definitely the right word for what HR 2990 does. And then fiduciary, and um, fiduciary is, is part of trust law and companies, including banks, they take that part, they do take that law very seriously. It's like a, it's like a solemn oath, it's like taking a solemn oath and so I really have um, little concern that um, that people will, that, that people and companies will break those oaths because their reputation would be nothing, that their company would be worth nothing if they broke their oath. So what the monetary authority is, is as um, set out in the, in the bill, is, is independent and autonomous. So we the people are on top, we, we are the boss of Congress. Congress is the boss of the monetary authority by um, creating the legislation which establishes it and, and gives it its objective, its reason for being. Then the monetary authority is the boss of the central bank which executes the policy directions and instructions of the monetary authority. So there's separations of decision-making, separations of power, separations of function. And what the bill author, um, re requires the monetary authority to do is to achieve this main objective. So it's quite, it's quite good to be able to gets that in one paragraph. <laughs> and really, that's, that's, that's really all they need to be told what to do, and then they, they, will, they will know how to do that. Again, the, what, what was meant by credit aggregates there is, is this. this um, these stages, because so that, 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 what that will give is it will give the monetary authority indications of what's going on in the economy. And so they'll be able to see if there's a lot of, if there's a lot of activity, a lot of money going into a certain area and not, not much in another. They'll be able to get an idea, get a picture of what's going on in the economy and that will help them with determining what they, they need to do to achieve the objective. So the, at the moment, what's called the monetary authorities in, in the US are the, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve System. And so the monetary authority becomes the, an overarching uh, authority or agency above, well, above but within, but, but independent within the, um, those, those other agencies. And it's, it's, um, it's placed in the Treasury um, because in, in the US there's three branches of government and it's pretty, it's pretty well defined. And the, the US Mint was the original monetary authority in the, um, or, or issuer of money in, the, in, the, uh, in America. And that started up as, a, as an independent agency, but it was brought in within the, the Treasury. And then the Bureau of Engraving and Printing um, was established within the Treasury. And so... Um, they, they were effectively the money that the providers, the suppliers of money in the economy for the, on the public side. Um, so for consistency, we don't see a, a problem with having the, the electronic money under that, um, under that roof as well. 
Okay, so the, the monetary authority is, is reasonably well insulated to be able to concentrate on its task without interference. <coughs> and, and there are some um, organisations within the US system of government which I was trying to look for some analogies of, to try and um, um, show that there, this, there is precedent for this sort of thing. And so these are the ones that I found that, that sort of relate, although they had to do with the judiciary and the courts. Um, and and uh, you know, money, money is not really a part of the judicial branch. Um, but so it, it's, it's between Congress and the um, executive. But these, this is a similar sort of arrangement that the judiciary has with the, with the Congress and the executive. So you see that there's, there's separations of, of power and separations of function to enable, there's really um, six or seven separations there, which I think is, uh, as we, you know, the, what do they say, there's seven, seven degrees of separation between one person and everyone else in the world or something. And so that's really um, the maximum amount of separation that we can, can uh, hope for. <coughs> and the monetary authority itself has no interest. It has, you know, like obviously banks creating money, they have an interest in doing that. Um, they've, they, they get profits out of that. They, you know, they can um, possibly control uh, other companies and things like that. Whereas there's no, there's no uh, interest like that with the monetary authority. It has no, it's, it's, um, dis it's got no interest of its own. It's, 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 it's just doing what it has, what it's legally bound to do for the, to comply with the law, and, and it's for the benefit of the whole economy and society. It, it, it doesn't get anything out of it itself. So there's no, there's no um, concern about people doing stuff for themselves. You know. So this is what, you know, that all of the stuff that they'll be looking at, and again, they'll be looking at these as well as indicators and, and the, you know, other indicators will be the interest rates on these and there'll be all, all sorts of information and they'll be, get, be able to get all this information from all of this alphabetical soup of agencies and, and um, industry associations. This is just some of them that I, off the top of my head. There's, there'd be hundreds and thousands of sources of information and, all, and a lot of these are what are contributing to the flow of funds accounts, information to the flow of funds accounts now and all of the other um, information that's collected so it's all, all this information is being collected now, so, you know, it's just a matter of putting it together properly. <coughs> and um, I'd also uh, recommend you have a look at this paper. This is quite a, uh, it's not about monetary reform per se, although it's, uh, um, Lord Adair Turner has, <coughs> this is, this is uh, the group of 30, which is basically the top central bankers and bankers in the world. He wrote this paper saying that basically we should be considering the government creating money directly and spending it into the economy. <coughs> so he, um, he said that it entails combining monetary policy and fiscal policy and then you have a choice whether what you do with that money goes into real output or into prices. And obviously to not have inflation you want it to go into real output so you want it to be producing new wealth. And that's what HR 2990 does, you know, with um, improving infrastructure, including human infrastructure like education and um, health and all sorts of things like that. And um, as Professor Yamaguchi showed with his analysis, it does not a cause of inflation. As um, Dr. Michael Kumhoff showed with his analysis, it does not cause inflation. Um, <coughs> so. It's obvious that if you go into this here, you won't have inflation. Okay, so I, I envisage that there would be some sort of process like this, but obviously this is something that will be worked out over time. And as long as you, if you, um, are able to match the demand for money, you won't have deflation. And if, as long as you don't go over what the economy is able to produce, 
you won't have price inflation. And so productive capacity is, is the ability of society to deliver goods and services as, when and where required. And when you think about, uh, so this is something that Stephen raises quite a lot, when you think about what uh, money has gone into to create a lot of stuff uh, without much limitation, it's been for war, and you think of what the US economy was able to produce during World War II, and when most of the workforce was not even in the country, the ability of the economy and society to do stuff is is awesome. It's, it's, um, it's very good. It's very, very large. But of course, we want to be able to do that sustainably. So that we're using resources only as, and they can be replaced. We can conserve our resources for the, for the future generations. Okay, so then there's lots of channels where the money can go through. Um, that already exist. There's a whole lots of programs of dispersing money to various things. That all of these things already exist right now. So, so it's um, there's lots of ways of distributing um, needed funds, including um, there's there's over 5,000 community development financial institutions or entities, uh, which are supported by the federal government. Um, 300 community development loan funds or, or community development banks um, and every state and, and lots of local government have their own versions of those as well will support them. <coughs> and so what, you know, one of the things that Mark Pash talks about is having diversified um, uh, lending channels and he, he, he um, raises these, um, these channels here and I think, I haven't checked each one, but I, I th I'm quite sure that all of these already exist. You know, EPA has programs, um, Department of Energy has programs. So I think that really it's all covered already. Okay, so the accounting. <coughs> this is um, a very simplified version of what uh, any bank's balance sheet would look could look like and um, so you can think of it as the whole of all of the banks combined just on one balance sheet and so at the moment all of our money supply is, is deposits plus a small amount of cash that's in circulation which is really a small amount um, so what we do we take that out it's, it's now it's, it's, it's uh, by law it's made money it's put in here it belongs to the to you, the account holder, and the bank stores it for you, obviously electronically, um, like an electronic safety deposit box. It's your property. They're looking at af after it for you. <coughs> so you see that leaves a, a hole here in the bank's balance sheet. So if we, if we left that hole there, their, their assets would be worth a lot more than their li the remaining liabilities and they'd have a huge um, increase in their net worth. So we need to balance that so that the, the bank's balance sheets before and after is the same. So we, we um, include this so that when, when money is paid from here to pay off these loans, it's passed through to the revolving funds to then be able to be recycled back into here. Okay, so this is the balance sheet for the Federal Reserve. They've, this is what the banks use for money, reserves, and we do the same process. That just becomes money of the banks. And it's brought in and it's, it becomes electronic safety deposit accounts of the Federal Reserve that they hold for their customers, which is banks and the Treasury and some other institutions, other central, other countries' central banks, um, international financial institutions like the IMF and World Bank and American Bank and Asian Bank and all of that. Um, also, the Depository Trust Company has an account with the Federal Reserve. They, they handle most of the securities transactions in the US 
and, and a lot of them around the world as well. <coughs> so now we have this Fed stock, and in the bill, it, it's, um, it gets paid back to the, to the banks, the member banks that were the shareholders. Um, now they've only paid in half of the stock, and the other half is kept is what the is what the Federal Reserve calls surplus, which re which represents um, what what the uh, banks are, can be called on to to do the, to um, pay in the other half if the Federal Reserve ever needed it to. So, um, okay. <coughs> so there's an option that it doesn't need to um, cost the government anything to to pay that Fed stock back because they've got these assets here um, that, that balance this stock so they can sell those assets if they want to to be able to pay the, the Fed, the banks back their stock. Likewise, um, to, there's another provision in the bill to um, cede to the revolving fund and that can be done, that could be done by selling some other assets that, re, that equate to the the amount of surplus, and that could be the, the seeding for the revolving fund. And then you see there's this, this, hole, this um, hole here, and there's the system open market account, which is the, the account that holds all of the Federal Reserve's treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and all of that stuff, and um, they don't need that anymore. So. System open market account. That's where they hold all of the treasury securities that they bought under, you know, for the open market operations, um, for quantitative easing, all of that, all, all of the all of the financial securities that they hold. So that they don't need to hold them anymore because the money supply does not need any backing. System open market account. So this is uh, it, it's uh, what it adds up to at the moment. It's 3.38 trillion dollars, and um, about a trillion of it is used to to back the Federal Reserve notes. Which um, it, even even economists realise that that's uh, quite stupid. Um, Dean Baker and Dr. Jane Dearester from the University of Massachusetts Amherst have both called that a fiction. So it is recognised by economists that it is a fiction. So we um, we don't need to have that fiction anymore. <coughs> so what uh, one of the provisions in the in the bill is to have an initial citizens dividend. And so as Stephen mentioned yesterday, the the amount of support that the banks have got basically represents that system open market account. Now, if that money had gone to the people, as Stephen said, it would have been you know, about $10,000 for every man, woman and child in the country. So, one, and well, that just so also happens to equate roughly to the amount of consumer um, debt in the economy, which I think represents the amount that people's incomes are not sufficient to be able to buy the things that, they, that are available in the economy to buy. So I think a good way of uh, um, wiping out that uh, unjustified um, situation is to have the citizens' dividend help people to clear that consumer debt, plus it would, it would still leave money over for helping them to um, reduce their mortgages and all sorts of other things, do what they want. Okay, so this is how payments would be made it's just, um, this is how, it's the same as how they're made in a, the bank account at the moment, if it's within the bank, but between banks, it, um, it's what's, what uh, computer people like to call a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And um, really, I've got my, one of my cousins works for one of the large banks here, and um, what, he, what he tells me is that um, the computer software and platform that they use for deposits now is completely separate from the rest of the bank's business and they basically this is basically how it operates now in, in, in practice. So then how, how, would, um, how would banks be able to make loans because that's one of the things that, that um, people often have um, a misunderstanding about with, with this reform. But really, it's very simple. It's exactly the way that 
everyone thinks that they make clones now. So you have people with, that want to um, to fund loans, and you've got the intermediary, bank being intermediary, and then the borrowers, and then the, the borrowers pay back. And it's so it's so simply a matter of cash flow between and and the bank, the intermediary handles the cash flow. Okay, so this is how it would look like on a balance sheet for making loans. And that's what, um, from one customer at a bank to, the, to another customer at the, at the same bank. And this is, would be if, if it was the bank had to borrow money from another bank to be able to make a loan to one of its customers. And the other bank could be the Federal Reserve, which administers the revolving fund. Okay, so another, another um, concern that's sometimes raised by, mainly by economists is they're, they're concerned about banks' liabilities becoming a, um, a sort of another form of money, quasi-money. So these are some, some um, ways I thought of of being able to make that so that it, that could never happen. So, as far as I'm concerned, it need not be a concern. And other, other um, things that, that could be, um, you know, part of the, the operation of this is some of the things that Richard Werner and, and Michael Kumhoff have um, discussed in their work. And that, that would work fine with this, with this structure. Okay, so just I'll go very quickly through this origination. I just want you to, to see that it, it's all been worked out and it actually follows, in the, for the most part, the existing procedures that are already in place. So that's for the coin. See that they, they, they record inventory there for coin that hasn't been delivered to the Federal Reserve yet. And then it gets um, basically monetized. <coughs> And um, the, the Treasury gets the seniorage. The, eventually, this is the way they, they work it, that the, 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 originally, the first the Mint gets the seniorage and then they transfer, they rebate that seniorage back to the, to the Treasury. And um, that's been working for 228 years or whatever, so I don't see any reason to, to change that. Okay, so, yeah, um, okay, the, the, the accounts at the Federal Reserve Banks are, are not reserves like in the present system. So uh, there's been, uh, even at this conference, there's been some, um, well, uh, some statements that, uh, that seem to imply some misunderstanding. So I want to... Um, make this clear to everybody that HR 2990 is not the Chicago plan. HR 2990 is not the Chicago plan. HR 2990 is not the Chicago plan. <laughs> HR 2990 is not 100% reserves. HR 2090 is not 100% reserves, or 100% banking, or 100% whatever. HR 2090 is not 100% reserves. It's not so, so it's, because that, that whole um, thing has some intellectual baggage. Economists think, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know about their 100% reserves, if they, if they know about it at all, which is pretty rare, but if they know about it at all, they think they've read somewhere, oh, well, that wouldn't have worked. So. If, they, if, if this is described as 100% reserves, economists will, if they know about it at all, they'll think, oh, that wouldn't work. Okay, so this is not that. So please 
don't call it that. Okay, so for currency notes, basically, uh, again, the same procedure. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing produces them, but the only difference is that the government gets the seniorage of the full face value rather than just being paid for the cost of production. So it's basically the same process. Again, they, they treat it as inventory until it's actually delivered. <coughs> so it's the same process. And the reverse procedure can be used for collecting in the Federal Reserve notes and replacing them with US currency notes, which is part of the provision in HR 2990. So now for the electronic or digital money. Um, there is some, some cost associated with that for running the computers and all that. It's very minimal. It's probably $1 per million dollars. But the, the agencies, the, the Mint, the Bureau of Engraving Printing and the Federal Reserve, they all operate now as not-for-profit um, cost recovery um, operations. And so there's no reason for, not, for, for changing that. That's a, I think that's a good way for that, that public services should operate. And so this is what it all looks like for the um, Treasury. You see that... Um, the Treasury has captured all of the seniorage and even, even the costs is captured as, as well. So it's captured the whole benefit of, of um, providing the, the money supply. Okay, so that, that liability that I showed you that, that in yellow that replaces the black hole of when deposit liabilities are taken off banks' balance sheets this is, where, this is where it gets repaid back to the revolving fund when it's received by banks. They, they, get the, they receive principal and interest. They take the interest like they would now, but instead of the principal being wiped out, cancelled, it's, it, because it's now money instead of um, banks' promises to pay money, which um, cancel when the, when the borrower um, repays that, that it, now it's money, we have to conserve that money supply, so we pass it through to the revolving fund, and then from the revolving fund it gets recycled back into the economy. And so the, the Treasury has quite a, a few channels of income coming and streams coming in, and revenue streams going out, and it's just a matter of them balancing. So these ones relate to the, the general fund, these ones relate to the revolving fund, Again, these ones relate to the general fund, these ones relate to the revolving fund. And so the revolving fund is lending to banks. It's also lending to local government under, under part of um, Title V, interest-free loans to local government. And so the, the borrowers take it and then it's paid back. And they can keep, keep doing that forever. And again, some of the, um, the, the policy uh, suggestions that, um, that have been discussed by Michael Kumhoff and Richard Werner would be applicable with the operation of the, the lending from the revolving fund. And, and again, interest rates that are um, in the market could be an important indicator for um, determining an appropriate interest rate policy for the lending from the revolving fund to achieve the objectives of the monetary authority for the good of the economy and their society as a whole. So the com the th there's three components to the federal government's budget. Revenue as now, seniorage, which there is a little bit of now, but not much, and borrowing if needed. And so, and additions to the money supply would be dispersed seniorage plus net lending from the revolving fund would be what would be um, adding to the money supply. Okay, so this is um, the, the, the element of HR 2090 which is making the, 
the system comply with the US with the Constitution and so uh, I looked at the effect of this on the um, the budget and the tax that would be required and the tax savings that the seniors could replace the tax and it worked out at about 35 percent for if you just um, that made it a reduction from in individual income tax. It works uh, from from my calculations. The, the senior age, if if we um, this is this is the amount of money that's been created by the system over the past ten years. So if we use that as a guide, the, use the average of that as a guide for um, the first year of um, this the changeover to the system then the seniorage in, involved with that could be could replace taxes up to 35% of personal income taxes individual income taxes what is that well it changes every day you know so there's no I don't, I don't really see a point in, in quoting a figure but you can look at, you can look it up on the, the budget website or and um, well I it was in the fine print on that spreadsheet, but I can't even read it from here. So, but that was only applied the first year, is that right? Well, in ongoing years, once the monetary authority has worked out, you know what the right, what the right. Uh, well, here's so that the historically over the last ten years, it's been conservatively about five hundred and forty billion, which is about. Three and a half percent of GDP, which is well within Dr. Kumhoff's stated limit of four percent. So, um, so yeah, there's well, there's the figures, um, but I, I can't even really read them from here. But that's I plotted it on a graph as well. So that's what it would that's what it would be. That's the that's the projection from the Congressional Budget Office. Um, without HR 2019, and that's with the um, deducting the seniorage. So it's about it's about a third reduction. So of course um, that means that people have more dis can have more disposable income, and um, then part of the part of it is for um, go to infrastructure, uh, which. Um, about half is, is unfunded at the moment, so that's why I worked out using the the best figures available that I could find from the Congressional Research Service and and all of the um, reports and, and the sources that they use, and that's what I work. And also the work of um, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to find good um, some definitive work on on um, employment generation. I used. Um, uh, the work of a, of a reasonably well-known economist, um, Poland at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who's sort of done quite a bit on this, and um, he's what a lot of the people that make um, submissions or um, pitches in, in Congress use. So, and now the the situation has um, been updated a bit. So, if we um, Actually, we distribute things up this way, which you know, I'm just. This is just like a. This is just like a um, exercise, like a, a tabletop exercise. Um, and with uh, foreign transactions, um, this is the way, this is the way I envisage them working. For different for different situations, and um, so what I think, my, my, what I envisage the, the way it working, means that it would um, tend to, over time, balance out. And so, um, if the uh, that, that affected what the trade deficit could be, then it would be. Uh, need to um, be a good impetus for getting off oil and into more sustainable 
energy sources and that would be a great opportunity for uh, research and development and employment like a, like a um, Manhattan project but not for making nuclear bombs but for getting um, better energy sources. So when I add, when adding all these things together and um, when you're in Congress you have to put everything onto one page. Um, last year I, I didn't even want to say the figure because I said it was embarrassing but um, this exercise it adds up to you know, 47.2 million jobs. So, um, and that's with about 3.5% GDP if it's done this way. So again, this is the, the components of the, or the provisions for Title V. And of course there are other options as well, like um, Nick Tiedemann has suggested. And that, you know, once we get our infrastructure up to speed and our education systems are good and all of that stuff, that human infrastructure is good, we can, um, and, and our society evolves and, our, and citizens uh, participate more. And I think, that I, 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 um, I actually agree with Nick that, that um, it should go to people. Okay, and, and so one of the things that um, you know, I was looking at is there ways that this could be affected from outside. And um, you know, the euro dollar is one of the things that people talk about. And um, I looked at it, I read a few papers on that. And I um, if this is here in electronic safety deposit boxes, this is the conclusion that I came to. Um, so, so I don't see how it could be affected. And, and um, the, the same goes, from, from what I've been able to determine so far, the same goes for what's called the shadow banking system and derivatives and things like that. They, they wouldn't affect the US money supply and the integrity of, and security of the US money supply. They may have effects on the economy, but they wouldn't affect the money supply. And so if they do have effects on the economy, the Monetary Authority can take that into account and be able to have, take actions to deal with that, to counteract that if it was a bad effect or, or to go with it if it was a good effect. So there's one of the papers and they go through and say unaffected. And particularly, I mean, particularly, this, this is talking about the existing system, but when, you got, when you're looking at these issues, you've got to remember that we're not talking, for, for HR 2090, we're not talking about the existing system, we're talking about a, a different system. So some of the things that can be problems in the existing system don't, aren't problems with the reform system. So for, for, fi for financial markets, because um, a whole lot of money is not going into backing Federal Reserve notes and, and, and um, you know, uh, f um, funding government um, instead of seniorage, the government should be creating the money itself. That means that those, when those funds are then released to be able to be invested in the private sector, so that, that um, should be a very prosperous private sector. And because banks can't um, create money and, and buy assets just by creating money, that means that their ability to manipulate the market would be much reduced and um, so it would be a, a, like a level playing field for all people operating in the financial market. Banks will be like any other financial business and they will have to actually um, obtain the funds before they, before they make purchases. And so I think that will be fair. Everybody will be on the same playing field, on a level playing field, rather than some being able to fly. <laughs> so yeah, so this is a, basically what we see at the HR2090 doing. And just to, to recap, the 
This is the three main elements that um, are required to do that. It's really quite simple. And um, it's basically what people think happens now or is supposed to happen now. And this is like a top ten list of, of things. And this is the one I'm working on at the moment is um, with, with um, a person at Positive Money um, to work out this because um, my thinking is that this would actually be very good for banks. It would make them far less risky and um, for, for, ver for lots of reasons I think it would actually make them more profitable or at least the profitability, profitability would increase relative to, to risk and relative to assets and liabilities. Thank you for your attention.